that seems obsessed with freedom. We don't want anybody or any rules telling us what to do. That includes God. Many of these days are leaving the church because God sets limits on their options with his commandments. And who needs that? Forget God. Forget authority. Live free. Though God's city gates are wide open, we want independence from God rather than communion with him. We prefer sin over salvation, autonomy over worship, and those choices are based on the logic of hell. Now, there's a subject we don't like to think about. In fact, many living today are in denial that it even exists. 74% of people believe in heaven. Only 59% believe in hell. Almost half the people we run into today have stopped believing in hell. And yet they're oblivious to the fact that their very lifestyle embraces the essence of hell under the guise of freedom. Let me explain. The gospel is rooted in freedom for. Freedom for God, freedom for others, freedom for self. On the other hand, sin is rooted in freedom from. Freedom from God, from others, from self. And these two concepts of freedom mix about as well as oil and water. Let me use three analogies to illustrate our preferences these days for the kind of freedom which equates to hell. Democracy, suburbs, and Facebook can be metaphors for understanding freedom. I understand that I'm glad to live in a democracy. I'm happy to live in the suburbs. I have nothing against social media. But democracy demonstrates our collective desire for, for freedom from God. The suburbs reveal our personal desire for freedom from each other. And Facebook illuminates our desire for freedom from ourselves. Together, these images show our preference for the kind of freedom that ends in hell. They help us see clearly that hell is not a prison that God locks from the outside against our repentant will, but it is a coffin that we latch from the inside through our unrepentant will. Hell is the land of the free. How do you picture hell? I tend to think of it like an island off the shore of the new creation where evil people are held captive and they're tormented for eternity. And what makes that scary is that not just bad things happen there, but they're happening under the same authority of God that we trust for our protection in heaven. And it's hard to believe that the torture of hell might somehow be necessary to safeguard the peace of the new heaven, the new creation. And so we have questions about hell. Does torture happen there? Have its captives received a fair trial? Is a place of eternal torment really necessary? Do we really want to place ourselves under the authority of God who is responsible for such a place? The paradox is that hell is less like an island off the shore of the new creation mainland. It's more like the mainland itself, televised, publicized, advertised. Hell is less like the realm where our hands are bound against our will and more like the realm where we are given the collective freedom to just do as we please. C.S. Lewis in The Great Divorce paints a helpful picture. Books of fantasy in which people are not only given the option to leave hell, they are given powerful reasons why they should leave. People who love them try to convince them to receive God's healing and get out of hell and enter into joy. But tragically, the vast majority refuse the offer. Toward the end, Lewis summarized the difference between those who prefer life in God's kingdom and life in hell. He says there are only two kinds of people in the end, those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, thy will be done. Hell is a place where God tells residents, thy will be done. 
Have it your way. Live as you want without me. That was democracy. C.S. Lewis didn't come up with this. He echoed Augustine's classic city of God. Two loves built two cities. The earthly which is built by the love of self, even to the contempt of God, and the heavenly which is built by love of God, even to the contempt of self. God's city is built by the love of God. It's a place where residents love God, love to worship Him. At the center of their public life, love one another in the love of God, are happy to give their lives to the glorious King and boldly proclaim, Thy will be done. It's a place of freedom for. God said He has an alternative. A place whose citizens want freedom from God, whose residents love themselves more than they love God. A place where the collective self is above the glory of God, and they prefer to hear the king say, Thy will be done. Life outside God's city is built by love of self, freedom from. Imagine God's kingdom comes down and you're invited to live in its capital. We'll call it the New Jerusalem. But suppose you're given another option. You can reject this offer, if you prefer, and you can live in another land far away in the distance. We'll call it America. You can live in the one you want. But you have to respect the governing constitution, the founding documents, the guiding principles of the respective spheres. Now, to live in the New Jerusalem, you must die to yourself and be alive to God. You must repent of your sin and bend your knee before the good king. You must leave behind your autonomy once and for all and enter into a union with your creator. Jesus has made citizenship possible for free through his atoning work on the cross, and he has flung the gates of the city wide open to anybody who wants to come. But the cost is forsaking your independence, turning from self-rule, repentance of your sin, death to self. Or you can live in America. Here the rules are different. Everyone is allowed to collectively determine the shape of their public life together to keep their independence, to live unto themselves. Whereas the New Jerusalem is a place where people want God at the center, this is a place for people who prefer a society without God at the center. The trajectory of our public life today reveals that we want a declaration of independence from the kingdom of God. We, the people, want to organize ourselves around our collective self. We don't need a conquering dictator to come in here and tell us God cannot be at the center of our public life. We are happy to vote that ourselves. Democracy is not the redemption of authority. It's the dispersal of authority. It's pulling authority out of the hand of one big king and placing it in the hands of millions of little kings. And while this can help limit corruption... You know the old saying, the problem with democracy is not, not bad politics so much as bad math. A thousand corrupt minds can be just as bad as one corrupt mind. And the problem isn't that it's bad to vote. Voting, checks and balances, proper rec representation, constructive participation in public life. These are great blessings of the modern world. The problem is deeper, rooted in our society's deeply rooted conviction that God doesn't have a right to rule in our public life unless we collectively say he does. We desire freedom from God, and God will give us that freedom. He has handed us over to ourselves. God has allowed us to choose hell in the form of democracy, and we prefer it that way. Yet God's kingdom 
lays claim to earth. Jesus is Lord of all. His followers look forward to a day when God's will will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Worshippers lift up their heads in hope, looking forward to the day when the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord. As King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus' authority confronts the kings, the lords of this world. Whether they are lone kings and ivory palaces or democracy, dispersed authorities like ours, the courtly monarch or the collective many are both confronted by God's kingdom claim upon us. And the point is not that people should be coerced to follow God. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. God gives us the freedom whether or not to follow him. And our society should be given the same freedom. And here's where the logic of help comes in. The handing over of a society that has chosen not to follow God is a space created by God for people who prefer to live without him, who desire freedom from him. Hell is the absence of God found in the presence of our own autonomy. Now, democracy is not a bad form of government. That isn't the issue. Checks and balances are good in a corrupt world. Representation government is powerful for minority communities who've been excluded, exploited, and oppressed. The image of hell fits in other forms of government as well. Take a dictatorship. Picture Satan as a dictator. Same thing. Democracy is the worst form of government except for all the rest that have been tried. This side of the kingdom, democracy may be the best form of world government. But here's the catch. When God's kingdom comes, democracy must go. Jesus' lordship, God's kingdom, do not ask for our vote. They invite us to participate with them, but they don't ask whether they might squeeze in with us. They lead. We follow, not the other way around. And that sounds good to me. Probably sounds good to you. But many feel revulsion at the thought of a society structured like that. Many want the old America over the new Jerusalem. Many prefer the old creation to the world that's coming. And yet when God's kingdom comes, democracy must go because America is hell in the presence of the new creation. Now, if democracy demonstrates our collective desire for freedom from God, the suburbs illustrate our personal desire for freedom from each other. We live separated lives. During the day, we work in our own little private office or in a cubicle that keeps others from interfering with us. When work is done, we get in our cars and pull onto the freeway in these isolated bubbles and a stream of other steel bubbles trying not to bump into each other on the way home. When we arrive home, we pass through a garage door that opens just seconds before we pull in, and then we enter into our personal space, our house. Once inside, the isolation doesn't stop. We need more space between us and others. Expansive floor plans separate the family into multiple rooms, a bedroom for each child who absolutely needs his or her own space, an entertainment room upstairs for parents, another downstairs for the kids because they probably aren't going to want to watch the same thing on television. A craft room, an office for the man of the house and the lady of the house because we need our alone time. And our houses keep getting bigger and our neighborhoods keep getting farther away. It's as if we are fighting for ways to get away from each other. If architecture is any indication of our cultural values, it says that we place great value on our privacy, our personal space, our autonomy, even from those that we love most. Now, I'm not saying that solitary time isn't healthy, but some grow up these days rarely ever seeing their family members even while living in the same house. It's interesting how C.S. Lewis in his fantasy, The Great Divorce, imagines hell constantly expanding, getting farther and farther away from God's city. This happens not because people are 
moving away f- from God alone, they're also moving away from each other. Free building materials are there for the taking. It only takes imagination for the houses to be built. So every time a quarrel breaks out, the neighbors just pick up and move. Or as it explains, they've been moving on and on, getting further apart. There's a bit of a rising ground near where I live, and a chap has a telescope. You can see the lights of the inhabited houses where those old ones live, millions of miles away, millions of miles from us and from one another. And every now and then, they move further still. C.S. Lewis pictures hell's growth as this impulsive, expansive breakout like a sprawling suburb in an ever-increasing distance from God's city and from each other. One disappointed resident says in C.S. Lewis's book, I thought you'd meet interesting historical characters, but you don't. They're too far away. Julius Caesar and Genghis Khan live astronomical distances away in the far-off periphery. Napoleon is said to be the closest, Two chaps made their journey to see him about 15,000 years of our time it took them. And that's what happens when people want freedom from each other. And we see that in America today, people living further and further apart. Hell is a sprawling suburb. We have more access to wealth, technology, and knowledge than any people in history, and yet we simultaneously feel more disconnected and unknown than ever. We hear a lot about community and the longing for it and an attempt to recreate it, but do we realize how the fragmentation is a natural result of the highest cultural value we have, autonomy of the individual? Cities and villages used to be centered around the public square, and that's where life was lived, in community. The court, the church, the city hall, the stores, the schools, on or near the square. Couples reared large families and tiny houses that couples these days wouldn't even consider as a starter house. A big factor was that people didn't have the means to do what we do now to acquire more space. But with more wealth and technology available now, we have what people probably wanted to do then, we take advantage of every opportunity that we have to create an ever larger, more distant house to provide personal space. Retreating further and further from others and ourselves. So if democracy is a picture of our collective desire for freedom from God, the suburbs are a picture of our personal desire for freedom from each other. Rejection of God does not lead to a liberated community living in bliss. Instead, it results in many isolated, miserable, lonely people. You don't have to look in the Bible to see what hell's like. Just look around at American suburbs. It's the social logic of hell. Hell can also be seen in Facebook. We were created to receive our identity from God. But we have been caught up now in creating identities for ourselves. Facebook is a place where identity can be created rather than received. We can mask who we really are and project how we wish to be seen. We can boast to a thousand friends and never truly be known. We can follow others and we think that will make us relevant while falling farther away from our true selves. Our network can be ever-expanding while our identity is ever-shrinking. Facebook illustrates our desire for freedom from ourselves. Again, C.S. Lewis in The Great Divorce paints a helpful picture. He shows a husband holding a chain connecting him to a tragic actor. This actor is like a Facebook profile. It's a persona 
that the husband has created for himself. He will speak only through the tragic actor, refusing to speak directly himself. It's a mask he hides behind. As the actor speaks, the husband shrinks. The actor laments all the ways he has been wrong. He refuses to let go of pride, and it enslaves him. As the actor accuses others and excuses himself, the husband is unaware that he is gradually getting smaller and smaller. He's a shrinking man. The mask he created to shield himself from God's truth eventually absorbs his identity and swallows him whole. The image of a shrinking man also originated with Augustine's classical book. It's a classical image of self and sin. Sin is self-love. Augustine said, we were created to live with our gaze upon God and others in selfless love. And that gives us a beautiful innocence, a lack of self-awareness, because we're caught up, we're enraptured in God and others. Sin pulls our gaze from God and others and turns it on ourselves until we value ourselves over God and others, and there's nobody left to love, not God, not others, it's just us. And that results in a shrunken existence, compressed, restricted, and small. Self-love shrinks us. We see it in Genesis. Prior to the fall, Adam's attention was on God and worship and on Eve and love. And after the fall, Adam hid from God in fear, and he blamed Eve in self-preservation. Prior to the fall, Adam was unaware he was naked. He was focused on God, not himself. It was irrelevant. In Genesis 2.25, he realized he's naked. Now he's ashamed. After the fall, nakedness is a problem. It made him afraid. It made him put on leaves. And that's not just Adam's story. It's ours, too. We were created to be focused on God and others in love. But sin alienates us from God, and it isolates us from others. Sin causes us to focus on ourselves. We start to manufacture identities to make us feel valuable, to justify to ourselves and to others our existence. In search of romance, we pretend to be who we think our romantic mistress wants us to be. We strive for success and security at work. We try to clean ourselves up with religion. We create a Facebook profile to cover ourselves with 21st century fig leaves. But it shrinks us. Now, Facebook is... Wonderful in many ways. It allows us to stay connected with people all over the world. We can show baby pictures and vacation snapshots all at the same time to people all over the place. Facebook is a fine place for those things. But when we create an alter ego on Facebook, grounded in our independence and our autonomy from our creator, it shrinks us. Self-love makes us less and less human. Hell is subhuman. We live in a culture of freedom from. Democracy demonstrates our collective desire for freedom from God. The suburbs illustrate our personal desire for freedom from one another. Facebook shows our desire for freedom from ourselves. And you put these together, and you have an alienated, fragmented, shrunken world. Hell is the land of the free, and it is small. Look with me at one more scene from C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce. Residents of hell, he says, must grow in size as they journey toward God's kingdom because hell is so small, they have to get bigger to even be visible when they arrive in God's kingdom. Hell is microscopically small. And again, social media helps us grasp this. All our social interaction feels unbelievably large in the virtual world. I mean, it spreads all over the planet if we want it to, but in reality, it only takes place in a bite of storage in a server rack in a metal building somewhere in North Carolina or North Dakota. 
C.S. Lewis refers to hell as gray town. When people journey from hell to God's kingdom, they have a hard time encountering reality because of the artificial place they've become so accustomed to. Their bodies appear ghost-like and transparent. Their eyes have to adjust to color of this new land because they've lived so long in gray town. It hurts to walk on grass because their feet are not solid enough to handle it. They run from falling rain because they fear it will pierce right through their bodies and destroy them. Like a fabricated existence in a virtual world, hell has become more comfortable than God's kingdom. They're told if they would only receive God's heavenly embrace, it would strengthen them. Their bodies would grow lively and colorful. They could handle this new condition called reality, the new creation. But they prefer smallness and immaterial nature of their self-enclosed, self-created world. Have you noticed how hell is preferable from the inside for those who live there, those who dare to begin to follow Jesus are heard saying things like this. Before life with God looked so small. Life with God looked restrictive, binding, like a closed-minded straitjacket. Life apart from God felt liberating, free, expansive, the freedom to be who I really am, not defined by another, not bound by another's claims on me. But when people experience life in Christ, they have a whole change in perspective. And you hear them saying things like this, my life before now looks small, restrictive, binding. How could I have lived like that? Life with God now feels liberating, free, expansive. God's love releases me to be who I was created to be. Christ has broken the chains, and he has lifted my gaze to greatness in the kingdom. I no longer have to create an identity for myself. I receive my identity from my creator's affection. The truth. Only when we experience the greatness of the kingdom of God can we see the cruelty of life sliding away from God toward hell. And that's what we're seeing all around us. When Jesus raised us from that water of baptism, we realize we need never again be submerged in the suffocating floods of sin and rebellion. When the Holy Spirit breathes new life of God into our gasping lungs, we realize we never want to return to our previous contained life. When the Father gently removes the scales from our eyes with his gracious presence, we see our former freedom from God was actually tyrannical enslavement, and we were the tyrant. Finally, we understand what Jesus meant when he said, the truth will set you free. As we head into a new year in our fast-changing world, I hope this will open your eyes to what you're seeing all around you. We're living in enemy territory here. It's been that way since the fall of Adam and Eve into sin. That gave Satan dominion over this world. Now the world plays by Satan's rules, and it gets further and further away from God's plan for man, God's plan for earth. Daily, we see the effects of Satan's delusions. Many beautiful, intelligent, powerful people go right along with what Satan is doing, and they accelerate the slide toward God. God has invaded Satan's territory. He's come with truth stronger.
than Satan's deception. He's come with life stronger than Satan's death. And we have come to know him through faith. And now we look forward to a day when the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. And that's not something God wants us to keep to ourselves. This eternal life given to us through Christ was meant to be shared. Though there are so many deceived that they resist God's gift of eternal life, we have to keep trying to rescue them because they're getting further and further from God with each wrong decision, with each decision based on the logic of hell. That's why all for one is so important. We have to go all out to reach the one. God loves each person so much. It was worth his all, Jesus. We must be willing to give our all for one. When you're focused on God and his plan for our world and your life, ironically, life becomes more abundant and free than you previously could even imagine. Share the truth. Live it. Share it. The truth will set you free. That's what we want to do right now. We want to share the truth of Jesus in a way that can result in eternal life. If you have never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I urge you to do it now while you can. Believe in Jesus. Turn your back on sin. Make him the Lord of your life. Be baptized so that your sins can be washed away. You can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you become more and more real. More and more vivid, more and more strong and able to live the life that's abundant and free. If you want that, why don't you come as we stand and sing?